Hi, welcome to Lights, Camera, Author. I'm Jim Juno, and in 1975, a little-known TV station called WTTV in Chicago paired two newspaper film critics, and it changed the way movies are presented. The critics' names were Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert, and for the next 24 years, in one form or another, they became the most popular film critics in the United States. There's a new book out called Opposable Thumbs, How Siskel and Ebert Changed Movies Forever, and their author's name is Matt Singer. Matt, welcome to Life Camera Author. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Not a problem at all. Now, I used to watch Siskel and Ebert when they hosted at the movies, which was uh, which was on national basis on uh, on public television. But their story started long before that. I mean, even before they were paired together in 1975. Um, tell me a little bit about Siskel and Ebert. Sure. Well, I mean, yes, the, the, the version you're referring to was sort of the second of three different shows that they hosted. Nowadays, we kind of hear that phrase, Siskel and Ebert, and we think of this show that was long running and it was hosted by those guys, but they, they technically it was three different shows and they, they kind of jumped from one place to the next. And they started at WTTW in Chicago on a PBS station and then they moved into national syndication first with the Tribune Company and then with Disney. The last version yeah. of the show is actually uh, syndicated by Buena Vista Television. But yeah, I mean, they were film critics before that working as journalists and as bitter rivals in Chicago, they each wrote for a competing newspaper in Chicago. Siskel worked for the Chicago Tribune. Ebert worked for the Chicago Sun-Times. And um, they were sort of competitors for about six years before the show started. And in that time, they barely spoke to one another, according to Ebert. They hated each other so mm -hmm. much and were so obsessed with beating the other in really every facet of their jobs that they they when they would see each other at a screening or something, they would just kind of you know, stare at each other and not exchange words. And apparently it was very awkward and uncomfortable. And then the reason that the show happened with the two of them together is that it wasn't either of their ideas. They were partnered together by WTTW. And while it wasn't exactly uh, love at first sight, in fact, it was more, more like the opposite. They, within a reasonable amount of time, they got very good at it and they had this unique chemistry. And so that is why it became... Siskel and Ebert and why they're still kind of uh, synonymous, certainly to my generation and kind of the generation before, right before mine and right after mine, they are kind of that sort of synonymous with film criticism. Those, those uh, three words. Right. Before they got together on TV, nobody went to TV with critics for, for reviews. They, they read it in the newspaper. And like you said, one was Chicago Tribune, one was the Sun Times excuse me allergies are acting up today you know so um but the um they weren't they didn't even i think was it cisco didn't even want to do the show uh when they first were approached he said something along the lines of why should i do this that's right well i think the story you're referring to is that you know they originally shot a pilot um, at WTTW, which you can, I mean, you can watch all, so, some of the early episodes are available online. You can find them on YouTube or a few other websites. And um, the pilot did not go very well. And it was stiff. It was uncomfortable. You know, Siskel and Ebert, uh, you know, at the time genuinely did not like each other. Um, but uh, the, the, you, you imagine them and you hear, oh, they didn't like each other. And you think of them arguing and, and you know, squabbling, debating on the show later and think of that amazing chemistry they had. But that was not present in this in this uh, this very first episode. And so the the, the pilot was aired. But nothing really happened immediately after that. And um, what happened was the powers that be at WTTW decided to bring in new, a new producer, this woman by the name of Thea Flum, who was working at the station but did not work on the pilot. And so they told her, you know, we want you to do something with this. They actually told her, according to her, I spoke to her for the book, and she said that they had given her permission if she had wanted to, to replace Gene and Roger, if she had thought she had better candidates for that job, she could have theoretically replaced them. Um, but she decided that she saw something in them. And, you know, certainly their print work spoke for itself. And they were already a big deal in the in the Chicago film world because of that. 
and had done a little prior TV work separately. So like she she had a lunch with them and try and can, you know, and, and said, OK, we're going to do the show now. And, you know, it's my show now and I want to do it my way and we're going to change some things, but we're going to do it and make it better. Are you in? And according to her, Siskel was the one who was like skeptical and supposedly that, you know, he wasn't so happy with the way the first one turned out he didn't like that it kind of came and went and he had this you know thea said when she reached out to him for for this meeting you know this was several months later and no one had contacted him basically after it had aired and i think he was a little miffed about that i suppose and so he before he agreed to try this again because they had already done it once he yeah he wanted her to convince him why should i do this and uh, her reasoning was, you know, I can make you better. I can I can we can turn this into a really great show, something that would really be successful. And uh, spoiler alert, she was right. So the, the <laughs> book kind of follows what happened uh, a little before and also a lot of what happened after that. I was going to ask you, and you answered part of it already. These two guys. And for those of you of a certain age, they're still around they're, The reviews are still around. I think there's even a website that's still uh, puts in uh, Cisco and Ebert uh, dot com or something like that, you know, and um, so it didn't stop when and it didn't stop when one of them passed away and then the other one eventually passed away. It kept it, it kept on going. But let me ask you the big question. Did they eventually get to like each other or did they just have a grudging respect for each other? No, I think they really did come to like each other with the caveat that they still could really get on each other's nerves. And, um, you know, that never entirely went away. They certainly came to uh, respect one another and to recognize the strength of their partnership to see how um, impactful it was on both of their lives, both of their careers and how together they were very, you know, effective and influential in the wider world of movies. Uh, you know, did they ever become besties and were they <laughs> hanging out all the time on weekends or whatever? Not really. No, they never had that sort of uh, relationship. They always compared uh, themselves to kind of a, having like a sibling rivalry. And, you know, I have two little kids myself and I, I used to go, I, OK, like when they would say that, you know, I have a brother and I don't really, you know, my brother and I get along. We have a nice relationship. But I look at my children and they're relatively close in age. And there are um, there are times when their behavior toward one another absolutely reminds me of the stories I was told about Gene and Roger because they were so hyper competitive. They always wanted to win and they were so focused on like. What am I getting and what is he getting and how come he's getting something slightly better than me? You know, they would fight about all these things like who got to sit in the seat next to the host on a talk show? You know, who gets to sit next to Johnny Carson or David Letterman? The thinking there being, well, whoever sits right next to him gets to answer more questions, gets more screen time, gets more of the attention. And how dare, you know, the other one get to do that when I should get to do that? And so that was a fight that they had all they endlessly fought about and they kept trying to find different ways to resolve it and would struggle they would flip coins to decide but then roger would accuse gene of always winning and perhaps having a weighted coin and cheating the coin toss and so then they would <laughs> then they would demand that the producers of letterman show them the videotape of their previous appearance to prove whose turn it was but then you know if it was Roger on the tape. Well, then Roger would say, well, how do we know that was the last time? How do we know that wasn't I, we weren't here since then? And Gene went, how do I know it's not my turn? You know what I mean? That was the sort of behavior they had. And I see it in my I see that in my kids, you know, like if I'm giving them M&Ms and I dare to give one six M&Ms and one gets five, the one who gets five is going to tell me that's not fair. And if one has three blues and the other only has two blues, forget it. You know, that's the thing, too. So, you know. They they were definitely a lot better at reviewing movies than my children, but they absolutely could. They they when they sort of got fixated on something like that, they had that kind of sibling rivalry. So, yes, they did come to really admire and appreciate each other. But there always was that little tension that could pop up if if the stars aligned or perhaps misaligned. Yes, there the, the, things could flare up. Tempers could definitely flare up yet again. 
Well, that's what made the TV show so great was that you saw this temper every once in a while come out. Not it wasn't often. I mean, they were highly professional and they were they were respectful for the most part of each other. I remember one particular episode where um, Ebert liked Benji the Return or something like that. It was a Benji, Benji the Hunted. Yeah, Benji the Hunted, and Cisco did not. And Cisco said something like. You gave a thumbs up to Benji the Hunted and thumbs down to some other movie. And Ebert, I thought, was going to jump out of his chair. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very, yeah, you're thinking of an episode uh, fairly early in their run at Disney. And yeah, Benji the Hunted was was the second of two movies that they reviewed on this particular episode that got very heated. The first one was Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket, which Gene Mm. thought was a masterpiece. And Roger said something to the effect of, it's not a bad movie, but it's not original and it's not a masterpiece. And he sort of expected more from Stanley Kubrick and he gave it thumbs down. And Gene was already kind of in shocked disagreement about that. And then a few movies, I think, you know, one or two movies later, they reviewed Benji the Hunted. And here, uh, Roger thought as a as a kid's movie, as a sweet movie about a dog, it it did its job. It served its purpose. So on that basis, thumbs up. And Gene again, was even more flabbergasted because here we have an episode where a few minutes ago you gave thumbs down to Kubrick and now you're giving thumbs up to Benji. And Roger's point was these are, I'm not comparing one another. I'm comparing them, you know, to the spectrum of what they're, you know, to their goals, to their ambitions and their, you know, whether they succeed on in that regard. In Roger's opinion, Full Metal Jacket did not achieve what it was trying to do in a film about the Vietnam War. But Benji the Hunted, in his opinion, did... <laughs> achieve what it was trying to do as a Benji movie. Um, so yeah, that that is certainly a, a really memorable review and episode. It's fun. If you want to find that one, you can find it online. It is very entertaining. They really uh, they really go at it. And, and when that would happen on the show, you know, one of the things that they talked about as a, a, a as part of the success of the show is that by that point, they they really tried as best as possible to record the entire show in one take from start to finish, they did not rehearse. They would obviously write their own reviews, the beginning of each part where they would look in the camera and say, OK, now we're talking about Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket. It's a war movie. It's blah, 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 blah. But then when the other person would respond, um, the first person did not know what they were going to say. So in this case, you know, like Gene did not know that Roger was going to give Full Metal Jacket a thumbs down. And I would I would assume he thought he was going to give it thumbs up because it's Stanley Kubrick and it's full metal jacket. So their reactions were totally off the cuff and genuine and their reactions to each other's reactions were also, you know, totally authentic. And because they would record one take as best as possible from beginning to end, they didn't have an hour or two to cool off in between reviews. So that's why when they reviewed Benji the Hunted, Gene's still angry about Full Metal Jacket. And then 10 minutes later, now we're talking about Benji. And yes, you know, so it wasn't like something that happened in the ancient past. And that really was one of the keys of the show and how it was made and how they made it and why it was so effective is that uh, (laughs) when there was one of these like psychic wounds, it could fester and linger throughout the entire show. And in fact, they argue the third at a third time at the end of the show over the home video pick, which was another Stanley Kubrick movie that was on a VHS tape, I believe. And they fought some more about the same thing. So <laughs> that's uh, another thing that made uh, the show so great is that the, they, they could hold a grudge for the entire episode. And often that made it for uh, very entertaining television. Let me ask you that. Now, they got together and you mentioned uh Flom uh, as the person getting them together. Um, who came up with some of the ideas like, who came up with thumbs up thumbs down according to what i was told (laughs) by a producer who claimed uh, she was there when it happened she was the person in charge of uh, the tribune version of the show which was where that was introduced um that was roger's suggestion um that was how she remembered it um the original version of the show at pbs did not have the thumbs that was a, a later thing in the early episodes of the show they would uh instead give yes and no votes So it was two yeses or two noes, uh, which does not have quite the same ring. But nonetheless, Mm. that was the rating system that they settled on. And actually, there was a lot of discussion about how they arrived at that, which you can read about in the book. That was a whole thing. When they left 
uh, the PBS show, Sneak Previews, to go to syndication and to, to start a new show at Tribune, it was determined by legal experts, their lawyers, whoever, that they couldn't be uh, sued for copying the idea of of two people sitting in a movie theater talking about movies. It was determined that that was not something you had, that was not intellectual property that could be protected. Anyone could do that. But it was determined that perhaps they could be in legal jeopardy if they took actual certain elements of the original show, including the yes and the no. Apparently they would have got they could have gotten in trouble if they had said yes and no. <laughs> so they had to come up with a new rating system. And supposedly um, it was Roger so, uh, who was credited in what I was told as the one who threw out that idea as, OK, well, what if we did thumbs up and thumbs down? And that was that was how it went. And later on, Gene would say in interviews, sometimes, OK, well, maybe he came up with the, with the thumbs up and thumbs down. But I was the first one to say thumbs way up, which, again, you know, kind of speaks to <laughs> that competitive side of, you know, he can't get all the credit. I've got to, You know, there's got to be something in here in, in here for me. Yeah, that, that to, me, and that, to me, I'm sorry, but this sounds like two big kids arguing, you know, <laughs> at, I mean, at times. They could have that um, that side of things. Absolutely. I mean, and people would say that at other times, you know, uh, they were they were I mean, they were great minds about yeah. film and film criticism. And um, they had great taste in movies and they, you know, they helped make filmmakers careers and they encouraged their audience to see movies they never would have seen otherwise. I myself included i was one of the people in that audience who was discovering movies for the first time through the show so yeah i mean that's part of again part of the appeal and the charm of the siskel and ebert story is the highs are high and uh sometimes <laughs> the behavior isn't always that pretty and nice well they were obviously very intelligent because one i mean that siskel went to yale yes. and um and i uh, see ebert was at i believe the university of chicago you, uh, University of Illinois, and then he did study at, at University of Chicago, taught at the University of Chicago, won a Pulitzer Prize. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they were they weren't lightweights, you know, they were pretty <laughs> good at what they did, but they also could, you know, sometimes they could fight. They didn't always get along. I was wondering them, but when Cisco passed away in 1999, it was it was a little bit sudden. Um, even though he he had he had passed away from brain cancer. Mm -hmm. um, no one expected him to pass away because he said they was taking some time off and that he'd be back the next season. And we know this didn't happen. Ebert actually was was very moved when he passed away, though, wasn't he? Well, he was shocked. I mean, kind of to, to your point, like, um, yeah, I mean, very few people knew uh, just how sick Gene was. I mean, it was public that he had had an illness, but he was very private about his his private life in general, but he was extremely private about this illness. And, you know, if you were watching the show, you could see that, you know, he wasn't 100 percent. He was not who he was before this had all started, which was in sort of the spring of 1998. But, yeah, he came back to the show pretty quickly. He kept working. He was still great on the show. Um, but. Yeah, I mean, and 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 you're right. He he even said like when he decided to, you know, he claimed he was taking basically the rest of the season off in sort of very early 1999 to recover. That was what like the public statement was. And he would be back in the fall for the start of the next season. That was what he said. And according to Chaz Ebert, Roger's widow, who I spoke to, they believed that they really I mean, you know, they could tell he wasn't doing fabulous, but that's what he said. And that was what they believed. And so, yeah, they were. Uh, and and really everyone on the staff believed it as well. And so they were kind of blindsided that, yeah, then he suddenly passed away. And uh, Chaz said and told me and has said before that, yeah, that Roger was completely devastated by that. Not just that uh, Gene had passed away, but that he he really wasn't prepared for it. You know, I think he found out like a, a day or two before um, from a phone call from a, someone in Gene's family saying, you know, he you he's not doing well and you know like they made plans to visit him after that but he passed away before they could even go and visit so yeah it's um it it, cer it certainly was a, a I mean, from the perspective of the people at the show yeah it was totally sudden and shocking 
They changed movies forever, as what the title says of your book. Now, tell me exactly in what way uh, did people, how, how did they change the movies? How much time we got? I mean, uh, that's a, that's a whole book right there. You know what I mean? Uh, the the short version is, I mean, in in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, I think at the time they had a lot of influence and impact. Their reviews had a lot of influence. Um, their show had a lot of influence, not only in regards to specific films and filmmakers. And we could make a list of all the filmmakers that they championed as they were coming up and helped um, give them careers. I mean, filmmakers said this to me in the course of doing research for the book. They would, you know, Errol Morris said to me, I don't think I would have a career if Siskel and Ebert hadn't not only reviewed Gates of Heaven, his documentary, but re-reviewed it over and over. They kept talking about it over and over. They reviewed it, then they reviewed it again when they were doing an episode on like buried treasures, shows that, uh, movies that had been overlooked. They talked about it again. They included it on their best of the year list that year. And they just kept talking about it. And he said that them doing that made an unbelievable difference in the trajectory, not only of that movie, but his entire career. And he said that for doing that, like he genuinely loves them and w what they did for him. Uh, that, you know, and that's one example of one filmmaker, you know? So that's one way. Another way is, you know, is like people like me, you know, there's, uh, when I talk to people for the book, I, I a lot of interviews start, uh, you know, with people saying, I, I think kind of like you did, like, I used to love watching this show mm -hmm. and I grew up watching it. I was in, you know, I grew up in New Jersey and, you know, I was going to just like the local multiplex. And then I started watching this show and suddenly my eyes were open to all these other movies I had never heard of older movies that I was not familiar with. And while I couldn't see them on a big screen, a lot of times what I would do is I would listen to the show and then I would say, okay, well, what can I find at the video store? You know, what are the old movies that they're talking about that I can get there? And it, it, it totally opened my eyes to so many movies and to the art of film criticism and how wonderful it is to think about movies, to write about movies. And again, like that's my, that's my story, but it is not just my story. And what, I love about talking about the book is how many other people feel that way. that are like, I love this show. I, and I grew up in a small town in, uh, you know, Montana or Michigan or F <laughs> South Florida. These are all actual places people have said to me in the last, you know, however many days. And, and we all kind of are like the children of Siskel and Ebert in a way. And we all have that in common that this show really inspired us and instilled this love of movies in us. And these people became the next generation of film critics, filmmakers, film lovers, journalists, podcasters, YouTubers, you name it. And so, yeah, I think that in that way, they also changed the world, not only of movies, but movie talk, pop culture in general, in television. So yeah, I think they're, yeah, I think their influence is, is enormous. Not only could they make a, make a, a movie, they could also break a movie too, couldn't they? Well, could they break a movie? I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, they could Could they hurt a movie? Probably. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there's plenty of movies out there that we could uh, list that they gave two thumbs down to or Three maybe even just <laughs> Yeah, or maybe just one. You know, they did. They gave two thumbs down to Beetlejuice. That didn't you know, Beetlejuice did just fine. Uh, Roger Ebert gave thumbs down to Die Hard. I don't think that that, you know, that, that movie did all right. You know what I mean? Like. Um, certainly if they, they gave, uh, thumbs down to something, it, that wasn't a great thing for the movie, but I think on the whole, the, th the two thumbs up was a much more powerful thing than, uh, than a two thumbs down. You know what I mean? Um, and uh, in a sense, the two thumbs up would be meaningless if they liked everything. Uh, hmm. the, you know, it, the fact that they did honestly dislike things, even sometimes movies that we now acknowledge are, or we believe are great movies. Um, the fact that they bucked that consensus to me speaks to the value of the show and their value as critics is if, if they if they agreed on every movie, what is the point of the show? And if we all agreed about every movie, why are we talking about it? Like the whole purpose of the show was the debate and the discussion. And if they always agreed with each other or with us, it wouldn't have been a very interesting show. And um, <laughs> the disagreement was at the heart of part of what made that show so special. Could a show like this make it nowadays? I mean, that's a very good question. And it's one that um, 
I want to say yes. I want to believe it could because I loved this show so much and I kind of wish there was a show out there on television at least like it. I think what we see now are there's plenty of shows that are succeeding like it in other realms. Obviously, you know, you look at sports talk and political mm-hmm. talk and you see a lot of shows that are, seem to me very similar to the idea of uh, of Siskel and Ebert, you know, two rivals or people who see things in very different ways fighting about something, whatever it might be. In terms of why there isn't a show like that about movies, that's a, a very good question, which I do try to answer in the book. And I sort of allow the people I speak to for the book or spoke to for the book to kind of give their answers. And I don't think there is necessarily one obvious or correct reason. I do think that in a sense, the model that they invented and and perfected, you know, it sort of has evolved in a way. I mean, the Siskel and Ebert, as wonderful as the show was, and as much as I loved it and it was influential in my life, you know, it was a 28 or 22 minute episode. And they talked about five movies maybe in that time, you know, four movies and a home video pick or something. That's not a lot of time to discuss a full metal jacket, much less a Benji the Hunted. You know what I mean? That's that's it's tough. And today, if you have a YouTube channel, if you have a podcast, you can talk about Full Metal Jacket for five hours if you want. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and so um, in a sense, that model does kind of belong to an earlier era. Now, would I have would I want to listen to the Siskel and Ebert podcast if they were alive today? Oh, my goodness. Yes. Like to <laughs> me, that would have been the ultimate. I mean, can you only imagine what they could have done if they had been alive to have a podcast? I mean, uh, you know. It, it would have been something special and um it's just too bad it didn't happen because i i certainly would have been a devoted subscriber i can i can tell you that much well i tell you what the book is opposable thumbs how siskel and ebert changed movies forever and the author is matt singer matt i want to thank you for being on lights camera author today it's been a pleasure thanks so much for having me